I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Kevin Cowtan, uh, who's going to talk to us about um, what we could have done to avoid the, the false pause in global warming. So at that point, can I hand over to Kevin? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, this is my first time speaking at a, a statistics meeting. Um, uh, but then I, I guess I, I had my first statistics paper published uh, uh, only a couple of years back. So it, it kind of fits. But it, this will be a slightly unusual uh, talk and content, I think, for that reason. Great. Thank you. OK, so uh, I'm talking about, um, it's a clickbaity title, but uh, I, I couldn't resist because it, it, it seemed to go nicely with the topic. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm not a, a statistician, really, and I, I'm not a, a, really a climate scientist. Uh, most of my career has been spent um, solving problems, writing software in uh, for X-ray crystallography. Uh, and this is one of the projects I've been involved in, uh, where we write software to interpret 3D electron density images in terms of atomic structure. So I guess that probably makes me a data scientist. Um, but uh, some of the techniques uh, that I had in that field also turn out to be um, relevant to other topics, and, and my, my, I, I tend to get, like many autistic people, I, I, I get special interests, and I became very interested in uh, the global warming hiatus, which was this period from around 1998 to 2013, when there was a great deal of attention in the media and also in the scientific literature to the question of whether global warming had stopped. So here, here's a a picture from from that period. Uh, I don't know if you see my mouse. Um, uh, if if it's like Zoom, then you do. Uh, where we can see that that depending on which record you were looking at, uh, it it looks to a greater or lesser extent that that there has been a change in the rate of warming that it had slowed down during that period. Now, of course, if you looked at at the media attention, and in particular. Um, uh, 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 discussion from, from sources which had an, uh, particularly strong political views, uh, they were drawing a, a lot of conclusions uh, from this about whether we needed to do anything about uh, uh, global warming anymore or whether the problem had gone away. And, and having to do things uh, 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 corporately is uh, uh, something that, 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 of course, uh, presses political buttons, and, and so suddenly uh, they developed an interest in, in commenting on the science. Uh, but did global warming stop in 1998 for a while? Um, well, of course, if we add a, a few extra years of data, then it, it becomes very obvious that, that no, it didn't. Um, uh, but uh, could we have known that at the time with more confidence? Um, so. Uh, I became interested in this, this uh, problem because of a particularly prominent feature of the data which stood out to me, uh, which I'll show in, in this animation, which shows uh, temperature trends in different parts of the planet. Uh, and this is the observational uh, coverage of the Met Office data set. And you can see uh, the colors represent trends, uh, warm colors are, are, are faster warming. And you can see that the uh, coverage of the Arctic is poor, and also that the Arctic is the fastest warming region of the planet. And there are other regions with poor data coverage, uh, which, as it happens over that period, are also faster warming. And so uh, I did some initial work on that area, which was uh, uh, Krieging, which is a form of Gaussian process modeling to infill the gaps in the data and see what that did to the trends. And we found that, that uh, a lot of this supposed slowdown in warming went away. Uh, so uh, I, that became my first climate paper, uh, the first excursion out of crystallography. Um, but the, the response from the climate science community was interesting. So some very senior figures uh, said, and, and many more junior ones said, we can't invent data. Uh, that was their interpretation of uh, this approach of 
of uh, infilling the, 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 uh, the missing regions. Now, um, this seemed to me to be problematic, uh, using as a statistic that we knew was, was wrong uh, uh, because of, of this rule of not inventing data, which, which they had raised, uh, uh, seemed to be uh, a problem. So the challenge for me was then to explain to climate data users why their intuition about statistics was wrong. And the first step was, was to, to, therefore to understand the statistics myself um, and, and then uh, go on to write a, a, a paper uh, with, for which uh, I brought on a, a real statistician who could uh, uh, point, fix some of my errors, uh, Richard Wilkinson, who's now at Nottingham. Uh, and then talk about it. Uh, and what I'm going to show you in the following slides is the talk I gave. Uh, there's also a version of it on YouTube, um, and, and they took it to a few sites around the UK. Now, the problem here is an interesting one. Uh, we know from uh, dealing with science denial that correcting misconceptions is much harder than teaching people new things in the first place. So, and this is really a, a problem of correcting misconceptions. So, the, it, the, the, this talk was very much built around uh, the idea of using simple concepts that um, people already knew uh, to show them how their intuition could lead them in the wrong direction. So, it, it, it's a problem of, of of uh, science communication uh, to scientists and also of misconception-based learning. So uh, uh, this is the, the, the kind of talk I, 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 I gave. So um, what is there to know? What's our starting point? Global mean surface temperature is, is the metric which we're looking at because it's a commonly used measure of global warming and is, is used to draw inferences about what we need to do uh, in, in terms of political or social action. Now, this in, in, involves observations, which, uh, as in any, any field of science, are messy. And it also involves a mean, uh, it, it's in the title, Global Mean Surface Temperature, which is a statistic. And uh, here I, is my attempt at a, a st uh, statistical humor. Um, uh, you can probably do better. So um, I've, what I'd like to do now is start with a puzzle. So one of the data sets we use for assessing uh, uh, global mean surface temperature is a data set from the UK Met Office called HADCREW T4. Uh, and there's a shaded region in, in the picture on the uh, left shows you the data coverage in 2017. Uh, I can't remember which one, month, probably January. Um, and it's covering about 83% of the planet. Uh, and it's a gridded data set in five degree boxes. Now, my question uh, for you is, if we are simply to calculate an area weighted average of, of all the regions where we have observations, then do we get a better estimate of the true global mean surface temperature from using just the shaded regions uh, on the left with 83% coverage, or by using the shaded regions on the right, where we only have 18% coverage, and it's a subset of the coverage uh, on the left. So uh, th th there's a question. If, if you really want, you can type answers in the chat, uh, but you've probably spotted that, that there is a bit of a trick going on here. But we'll come back to the question in, a bit later. So. Um, this this um, uh, period, this hiatus period of, of warming uh, uh, got a lot of attention in the media, but also in scientific literature. Uh, there were many papers published on it, but also in uh, the IPCC uh, assessment reports. So this is from the fifth assessment report. Uh, the, there's a box in chapter nine and, and another one in chapter two um, on, on this supposed hiatus in warming. And I'd like to highlight a, a few things that, that this, this box says. The trend in the HADCREW T4 data set is 
0.04 Celsius per decade over the period 1998 to 2012. Uh, and it, it, that's estimated to be a, a a third to a half of the long-term trend. And then it goes on to give us some uh, explanations, possible explanations for, for, for this, uh, this obs observation. And it suggests uh, that this could be down to internal climate variability, in other words, weather. Uh, uh, it could be problems in, in, in the numbers, uh, the atmospheric compositions, which were being fed into climate models or a, an error in the model response to those influences. Now, the interesting thing that, that's missing here is anything to do with, with uh, problems in the data. So that's interesting um, and uh, kind of relevant. So uh, let, let's go back to basics. What does mean mean in this context? So I, I think if I were to give you the phrase global mean surface temperature, then uh, most of you would immediately uh, interpret it as something like this, the integral of temperature over longitude and latitude um, uh, um, um, integrated uh, over area. And to form an average, we divide by the surface area of the, of the Earth. Um, now, because we're dealing with gridded data sets, then uh, this becomes a summation of the temperature in each grid box, uh, and then we have a, a cosine weighting term. Uh, climate scientists refer to as, this as a, a cosine weighted mean, and it just gives you the effect of an area integral with, with the um, area of each grid box included. And you can see some examples of, of uh, the, the data coverage for different periods in the 19th century. It, it's rather limited. Uh, by the time you get to post-World War II, uh, we've got reasonable coverage. And, and once we get um, uh, robot boys drifting around the oceans, uh, then it's quite good. OK, so I, I, now I want to, to talk a little bit about this concept of mean and, and how it isn't always as simple as we think. So suppose we want to calculate uh, the average height of, of human beings. Uh, so we could take a sample and measure how tall they are. Uh, so uh, here we've got a, a sample with 40,000 men and 10,000 women. And I think most of you will be, will be able to see that if we use this sample and take a simple average of, of the heights, then we might get a, a misleading um, uh, answer because cis men are on, on the whole a little bit taller than, than uh, cis women. So what could we do? Well, one very simple thing we can do is throw away a lot of observations. So if we throw away 30,000 uh, observations of men, so we've got a, a, a representative sample of 10,000 men and 10,000 women, then we'll actually get a better estimate of how tall people are in this case. Okay, that I hope is, is, is simple and obvious. Now, a slightly more tricky case, what if we have a very small sample of four men and one woman? Uh, so in this case, uh, would we be better off uh, getting rid of, of three observations? So we have one man and one woman. Well, the problem is uh, we might it, this might actually give us a worse uh, solution because with just two people, the chances of both being tall or both being short are, are now 50 percent. Um, whereas with five people, the, the chance is comparatively smaller. So with a sample of 50,000 uh, observations, throwing away uh, 30,000 uh, makes things better, clearly. With a sample of five, throwing away three observations, it, it, it's far less clear that, that, that that's, that's a good thing to do and might make things worse. So what's going on here? Uh, there are two sources of error here. One is sample noise from having a small sample, and the other is sample bias from having an un unrepresentative sample. And both lead to a difference between the number we get from our mean and the true uh, uh, mean of, of the entire population. And these require different treatment. Um, now, 
I've, I've suggested throwing away data. That's not the only uh, approach. We could instead weight the data um, to reflect the population. So if you weight the men at one over 80,000 and the women at one over 20,000, then you can include all of the observations um, and but, but the, the different weighting will mean that, that the mean that you get is representative. This doesn't make the problem go away. With five people, uh, the one woman in the sample receives the weight of a half. So if she's unusually tall or short, she will still bias the sample. So using weight doesn't completely solve the problem. It, it may help a little bit. So we, we need different weighting schemes for different sample sizes. So to minimize sample bias, we want to weight observations according to their prevalence in the population. To minimize sample noise, we want to weight observations equally, assuming equal error in the observations. So it looks as, as though we need a different statistical method for different sample sizes. And, and that suggests to me that, that, that our understanding of what, what is meant by taking the mean of a sample is wrong. Okay, so what are we going to do about this? Well, um, what we need is a method of calculating an average which optimally weights the data, taking into account both sample noise and sample bias in order to give a best estimate. And the weights will then vary both with the noise and sample size. So how might this work? So uh, there is a technique which um, uh, uh, every uh, scientist will be familiar with, which is ordinary least squares. So uh, we most commonly use this to fit a straight line through data, uh, a set of data points, um, uh, where we're, we're essentially fitting a model with two parameters. But we can fit more complex or less complex models. Uh, here I've fitted a quadratic, which has three parameters. I've also fitted a constant, which has just one parameter. Now, fitting a constant by least squares um, it's, it is an uncommon thing to do, but it turns out to be mathematically identical to calculating the mean uh, in the case of, of, of equal variance of the observations. Uh, the mean is a least squares estimator of a constant fit to the data. But ordinary least squares depends on assumption about the assumptions about the data. Firstly, that, that, that the observations have uh, equal variance, and secondly, that they're independent. Now, are these assumptions plausible in our case of, of, of averaging temperature data? Now, I haven't mentioned these are temperature data anomalies. They're deviations from seasonal norms. So here we've, we've got a little bit of variation. But if, if, if we look at this month of data, then you can see that, that there are period, uh, regions of, of, of extended uh, higher or lower temperatures. So there's clearly uh, not complete independence. And uh, we also see that, that land areas show a bit more variability, that it's perhaps a bit noisier. So the, the assumption of equal variance is probably not very good either. OK, so how do we deal with this? Now, um, uh, you may remember from, from uh, 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 early statistics classes that there is an alternative and more complex approach called generalized least squares. And uh, the equations differ from ordinary least squares in that we insert an additional matrix in the equation that we solve for the parameters um, of the model. Uh, and this is a covariance matrix. It tells us about uh, the variability of each observation and how it co-varies with uh, other ob observations. In, in other words, it's, it contains implicitly information about how much independent information each observation contains. So um, we've seen that uh, we can use ordinary least squares to calculate a mean. It's a model with one parameter. Uh, but we can also use generalized least squares in the same, for the same problem in the case where the observations are not independent. Uh, so what happens when we do this? 
Well, here's a very simple case. Uh, uh, suppose we have complete coverage of the planet. So here, here's our gridded data set with complete coverage. And I've used generalized least squares to calculate um, uh, the weight to be given to each grid box, each observation uh, in a, uh, our uh, data set, uh, just using the covariance matrix, where, where we have a very simple model of, of how covariance drops off with distance. And what happens is that generalized least squares decides for us that, that observations at the equator have to have a, uh, a larger weight than observations at the pole. And if we, we plot how those weights vary, uh, they show this cosine shape. What's happened is that generalized least squares has deduced cosine weighting, uh, area weighting of the grid boxes without being told explicitly um, anything about the grid box areas. It, it, it's just inferred that from how close the grid boxes are together and, and therefore what the associated covariances between uh, those observations would be. So that's an, an interesting uh, result. The mathematics gives us something for free that we didn't put into it. Here's a, here's a more interesting case. So now I've got complete observational coverage of the Western Hemisphere, but in the Eastern Hemisphere, I've only got a quarter of the number of observations. Uh, uh, I've, I've thrown away uh, three points out of every four. And this shows the weights that's going to be, uh, the weights that's going to be given to each grid box in the data set. And, and you can see we, we still have the cosine weighting in, in the Western Hemisphere, and, and also of the observations in, in the Eastern Hemisphere, but they have been upweighted by about a factor of four. Uh, if, if we didn't do this, then, uh, and just calculated a simple area weighted average, then we'd get a temperature which was 80% uh, the temperature of the Western Hemisphere, and 20% the temperature of the Eastern Hemisphere. But um, by introducing the generalized least squares for, for, for determining the weights, we have got um, a, the resulting average will, will give the hemispheres equal weight. Okay, so, so that's a nice result. Let's look at a more extreme case. Now suppose we have full coverage of the Western Hemisphere and just one isolated observation in the Eastern Hemisphere. Now, again, this observation gets upweighted, but uh, it's certainly not upweighted to uh, the same value as the whole of the Western Hemisphere. Um, uh, in fact, if we calculate uh, what area of observations would be required to give the same weight as this single observation in the Eastern Hemisphere, it, it's actually given by this, this circle here, which has a radius of about a thousand kilometers, which is about the, dis, the, the e folding distance of, of, over which uh, covariance drops off, uh, the, the area, uh, the distant length over which uh, temperatures are a good predictor for neighboring temperatures. So that's another interesting result. Um, this one observation can't tell us about an entire missing hemisphere of observations, but it can tell us uh, uh, about an area around it, and it has been upweighted in accordance with the, the, the area about which it is actually informative. Um, so, Okay, so that, that's that's lots of nice theoretical cases. That kind of brings us back to the puzzle I uh, suggested at the beginning, um, and, and we're now really in a position to this. What would give us the best estimate of global mean surface temperature, the coverage on the left or the coverage on the right? So uh, to work this out, um, we, we can uh, do some calculations. We can use simulated data. Uh, in this case, it's going to be from a weather model, uh, which has um, it produces plausible temperature fields covering the whole planet. And what we're going to do is reduce the coverage to, to uh, one of each of these cases uh, and, and calculate both the true temperature for each month of data and the, the what we would get from an area weighted mean with reduced coverage. And we can then uh, uh, produce an, uh, uh, um, determine the error 
uh, in those estimates by, by doing lots of different months and, and, and see how far off uh, we are when we use limited coverage. So uh, what I'm going to do is a, a little animation of doing this. And what I'm going to do is start with the uh, Head Crew T4 coverage, the 2017 coverage. And then I'm going to throw away grid cells one at a time, uh, always picking the one which would receive the lowest weight in, in um, generalized least squares, the one which, which it says contains the least information. And we'll see what happens when we do that. And I'm going to plot error in the graph at the bottom. And there'll be two lines. The lower line will be in the case where, where the grid boxes contain zero error, where the, where, where the temperature estimates in the grid boxes are perfect, and a, a, another line which will show the case where there are errors in the observations. So I'll start the animation now. So first, when we start throwing away uh, uh, grid boxes, nothing happens. And then uh, the uh, error starts reducing, and we, we can see that, that with systematically throwing away observations in the regions which are most densely observed, we're not throwing away the, uh, observations around the edges yet. And as we throw away more, then, then the errors actually go down, both in the, the error-free case and in the case where we have uh, errors in the observations. Eventually, it reaches to the point where, where the, 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 the noise in the data begins to significantly impact the, the, the uh, resulting mean. So the upper curve starts turning upwards. And then gradually, we reach the point where the lower curve turns upwards because we simply don't have any observation, enough observations to represent the whole surface of the planet anymore. Um, so that's interesting, and that allows us to answer the question I posed at the beginning, uh, which was the best estimator of global mean surface temperature? Uh, my original data set with 83% coverage, or this one with 17% with coverage, and you can see both in the error-free case and the case with errors, uh, the reduced coverage gives us uh, the better answer. Uh, because in this case, it is more representative um, uh, even though we have uh, fewer observations. Okay, so what's going on here? I, I, I think for me, one of the things that I do with a, a piece of mathematics is that I attach a narrative to it which helps me to think about uh, the mathematics. Uh, and that allows me to draw quick inferences about uh, what a calculation might do or whether it might be useful uh, without actually having to do a simulation. And that can be really helpful if the, the narrative I have uh, attached to a piece of mathematics is appropriate for the particular problem, but it can be unhelpful if the narrative is, is, is inappropriate, uh, if it, it doesn't apply to the case. So the, here, here are three narratives that we might really apply to the concept of taking a, a global mean with incomplete um, coverage. So if, if, if we interpret this as, as having too few observations in, in the Arctic and needing to invent some, then our um, a, a, other scientific intuition about inventing observations rebels against that, and, 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 and we say, oh no, that, that must be wrong. Uh, if we say we have too many observations elsewhere and need to throw some away, then, then uh, perhaps that's in some ways a better framing. Um, it, it, it does bring in the concept of, of, of having a more representative sample of the population. Uh, but in, in this case, uh, had we started with, with a narrative saying each observation should be weighted according to the independent information it contributes, then I, I think we would have um, ended up with, with a better intuition as to how to, to uh, uh, calculate a mean in this case. Now, None of this is new or clever. Um, uh, this was all, all, uh, already published in, in 
uh, a much more sophisticated analysis by Ruven Kagan uh, in Moscow in 1979. Uh, he published this book in, in Russian, which was eventually translated. Uh, one of his colleagues, Finikov, um, uh, then uh, moved to America and um, some of the work was, was continued at NOAA, but uh, uh, didn't was not sufficiently influential to be, be widely adopted in the um, uh, IPCC report, uh, although it received some attention. But hopefully uh, uh, now this is, is being more widely recognized. Now, uh, what difference does it make? Uh, just to show that, that, that it, it does make a significant difference. Uh, we had this number reported in the IPCC assessment report of, of four hundredths of a Celsius per decade. Um, and and um, th th there are a, a few crude methods which have been used to, to, to try and address the coverage problem. Uh, if, if I use this, this uh, generalized least squares approach, uh, then we end up with a figure which is, is more than double that. Uh, and that that's a significant difference in in the trend. Uh, there are other factors as well. Um, so, uh, for example, um, this the, the data on which the, this trend calculation was based uh, included some stations which were uh, present for the first half of the hiatus period, but missing for the second half. Uh, and 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 that created an additional data bias, including those made a difference. Uh, and there was also a, a change in the way uh, temperatures were measured in the shipping fleets. Uh, so the sea surface temperatures also contained a bias which influenced the result. So we end up with, with, with a number which is very different. Uh, I, I think current consensus would be much closer to a number like this based on mod modern data sets, which is very different from the number that was in the original uh, report. Uh, nonetheless, there have been at least 200 papers. I, I think our, our catalog's up to about 300 now. Um, uh, this was uh, a, a piece of literature review done by a colleague, Ari Yokimaki. Um, uh, two, two or 300 papers studying this phenomena, which in large part was arose from uh, problems in the data. And there were some useful things which came out of that, um, but uh, many of the, 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 them were really barking up the wrong tree. Okay, uh, what are the implications? Intuition is unreliable when it comes to statistics. Even a simple average may be more complicated than it seems. Um, I, because this was for a climate audience, I, I, I was um, uh, uh, introduce some some commentary on on the data product products. I, I work with the Met Office team, um, and I'm working on on the next generation data set. Uh, and and there are places where where their data and and, and their data analysis are world leading, um, but. Uh, using simple summary statistics um, uh, can on those data sets can certainly be. Uh, misleading, and and um, I'm suggesting that that the simple area what made weighted mean may not be obviously wrong, but it is trivially wrong in this case. Um, one other thing, which which uh, maybe it is is worth introducing, uh, although it's it's not directly connected with what I've been talking about, is the fact that we have many different versions of the temperature record from a uh, different provider providers, um, uh, two US government agencies, the UK Met Office, there's one which I produce, and there's, there's uh, one from Berkeley Earth. Uh, and it's interesting to ask why people pick one record over the other. Um, uh, uh, how good is their criteria for deciding which data set can answer their research question? Uh, well, uh, I did a little survey of what, what, which data sets different authors used. And uh, interestingly, if you compare US authors and UK authors, um, US authors are proportionally much more likely to use a US data set and UK authors are proportionally a lot more likely to use a, a, a UK data set. Um, and, there may be, in some cases, 
rational regions, reasons for this, for example, access to expertise. But um, it would also be surprising if there weren't an element of affinity bias. Um, so uh, if someone shares traits with us, we're more likely to uh, trust them uh, um, and view them as competent. Uh, so I, I, I think that this plays a role. And the reason I knew to look for this is that I'd seen exactly the same thing in people choosing which software to use in X-ray crystallography. So I, I, I think we can't neglect these social factors when understanding why people use data. Okay, so that's really an, an unsolved problem. A user of data looking to answer their own research question uh, has to evaluate different data products and ask whether the data are capable of answering their research question. And as data providers, we don't always effectively communicate the limitations of our data, and users may not ask what questions to ask. And we can't expect every user to become an expert in the data because they need to be experts in their, their own problems. All of us only have so much headspace. So th this is an ongoing challenge in the scientific process. It's a, a challenge in crystallography and it's a challenge in, in climate science and I imagine in, in statistics as well. And, and I don't have a solution to that one. Okay, uh, so that's all I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, the co-authors on the statistical paper on this were Richard Wilkinson, Peter Jacobs, and Peter Thorne. And, and I also have very useful comments from Liz Kent, Carsten Haustein, and Robert Way. And thank you everyone for listening and for inviting me. Brilliant. Th th thank you very much, Kevin. Kevin. And, and to, so, someone else already worked out how to do the, uh, the, 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 the uh, sort of an instant applause uh, icon, which is uh, great. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of put, pause to invite others to enter any comments in the chat bar on the on the right hand side um, if, if, if they have, have any questions or comments. Um, I, I just, I just want to, one thing that sort of struck, struck me right right at the beginning of, of your talk that you you presented data in a different way, um, and I think you were suggesting that it, it, you know, that actually the, the increased temperature might have been higher in that period than. Than, than, than was generally thought, uh, but it was the it was the climate data experts that were challenging you, rather than that rather than the uh, the, you know, the 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 naysayers and the uh, and the and the skeptics. And were, were, you, were you surprised by that? Um, so I, I initially got involved in the problem because of um, a, a science denial, um, uh, trying to address the issues there. Um, but um, it, it, the resistance from within the community was, uh, to, it was in some respects surprising and in some respects not surprising. So um, people in the climate science community had, had been very badly burned from their initially, uh, initial attempts to engage with, with climate Science, with, well, with science deniers in general. Um, so, uh, and as a result, I, I think a reaction to that had uh, become very, very conservative in, in their interpretations. Um, so, I, I, I think that, that that has impacted people, particularly in this country um, and in America. Um, so, in that sense, I am not particularly surprised. Yeah, great. Yeah, and then it make, makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think, yeah, people want to be very, very sure of their ground, I, I, I guess, <laughs> if they're making, making that case. Um, I think, I well, welcome any questions from, from um, and, and anyone else. There's one sort of te technical thing that and I'm, I'm not not sure if I'm just I'm maybe slightly out, out of my depth on the, the technical bit of this so so my, my, my understanding is you, you talked about sort of estimating the average temperature at a point in time and that obviously has knock-on consequences for the the the, the, the trend um and I, I just wondered whether you know, are there any sort of systematic reasons why if, if there's an error in measuring the average temperature that that error would vary over time 
and 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 feed into the you know, and give you a different answer for the trend. To, to that make sense as a question? Uh, oh, there are there are lots of systematic errors. The, the, the biggest ones are in sea surface temperatures. So transitions in observ uh, observation types from buckets to engine room intakes, um, and and also a variation in in. Uh, location of where weather stations and and how they're screened. So there are lots of systematic biases, uh, all of which need to be handled, and and the whole process is very very complex. Uh, but given that most of these observations were made for meteorology purposes, and, and no one had any idea that they would be uh, trying to um, uh, uh, answer climate questions with these uh, observations. Um, so, uh, and and some of them are still not understood. The the, the change in readings from ships are uh, running from about two thousand and eight. Uh, last time I, I looked at that problem, it, it wasn't understood. We published a, a paper showing that it was there, but but we don't really know where it comes from. Um. So, um. I, does that answer your question, or were you going going somewhere else with it? No, no, I think I think it does. Yeah, no, yeah, that's, yeah, that's no, that's, that's really really helpful. It, it's a, it, it's a, it's uh, a there's a question from Douglas about uh, yeah. comment on the use of numerical model analysis in this kind of, of global mean. So uh, yes, we we have the simple observational data sets, uh, which are what I've been talking about, and um, there are also uh, called uh, these data sets called weather model reanalyses. Uh, where you drive a weather model with uh, either all the observations you have, um, uh, much more diverse ranges of observations that we use in the products I've been talking about, including satellite data, or from uh, more limited ranges of data, where, um, um, types of data where, where you're aiming for uniformity. So there are some data uh, reanalyses which um, uh, just work from pressure data, um, uh, pressure on wind rather. So um, uh, they are. We make lots of use of them, but um, I, I think there's a kind of social convention that the historical records are the longest and therefore are most trusted. Whether that's a valid perception is, uh, for me, an open question. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that the simple observation records are better than the reanalysis records, but they have different problems. Uh, the, people prefer simple data sets over complex ones, so that might be the explanation for why that's the case. Um, but yes, I make a great deal of use of reanalysis data, but um, it is less useful for in the communication context. Uh, can I hand over to? Um... Professor Douglas Parker, who will talk to us about analysing and predicting African rainfall. OK, thank you, John. I thought uh, I would just start with this animation of clouds over Africa. So the top left panel here is observations and the others are, are models. And um, so the observations, the top left are satellite temperature measurements and they're coloured so that blue is cold. So the blue are the very, very and the blue and the purple are very cold, intense thunderstorms. Uh, I, I'm talking about African rainfall, but I'll focus on West Africa, which is where we've done a lot of work. Um, so you can see a few characteristics of these storms. I mean, firstly, they are, if you know the geography of Africa, some of these are really big. If you see that one that's now decaying over the West, that whole envelope is you know, thousands of kilometers across. And they're really intense systems. They're going off the West Coast. That system is really intense. When it gets really purple and very cold tops, that's a really intense thunderstorm, probably 15 kilometers high. Um, in altitude and um, very active, very heavy rain, um, a lot of lightning, intense winds at the surface. Uh, you see a strong daily cycle here. So this is about three in the afternoon when lots of little storms pop up in the afternoon. You can see a lot of organization. So you can see they organize into lines. Uh, and as you go into the night, the time is just in the top index, if you can read that, but this is three in the morning. So in the, overnight, then you're left with just big big storms moving around on their own, big organized systems. Whereas when you come to the next afternoon, so we're at 11, 12 o'clock, 13, and 15, they usually go bang. So here, 1500, they're starting to appear again. And again, they're organized in lines. Um, and then as you go into the evening and night, they, they cluster into big, big systems. 
Um, so this is just to give you a feel. I'll, I'll jump out of this now. We could watch this um, for the whole half an hour if you wanted, but um, but that was just, as I say, to give you a feel for what um, rainfall looks like from space uh, in this part of the world. Uh, and I'll go into the presentation now, if I can find it. So uh, I discovered this concept actually this week. I, I think it's it's kind of hokum, but this and but therefore A B T approach. I think it's kind of hokum because I think we already knew this. Everybody knew this already, but it's kind of uh, it sounds to be popular jargon at the moment. So I thought I'd try it out. So the idea is, if you're telling a story, um, then you have to have this A B T. So you have to have an and, which is all the facts. So uh, rainfall is vitally important for populations and economies of Africa. So I think you, you can all understand that. Everybody can understand. Uh, that rainfall can be very intense in Africa, but equally there are very dry regions that depend critically on the rain. A lot of people in Africa are dependent on agriculture, so there's a lot of subsistence farming, uh, and the economies uh, are, are sensitive to, to rainfall in many ways. Uh, and if, if you can predict rainfall, then you can save lives from, you know, from natural disasters, uh, both for drought and, and for floods and, and intense storms, uh, and protect livelihoods. You know, people lose their their crops, if there's drought or if there's flooding, uh, they can lose their animals, they can lose their lives, of course. Um, so good predictions can enable people to, to, to respond and, and, and live more comfortably. Uh, so the but is that our predictive systems, our models, both for climate and for uh, weather on short timescales, even on timescale of a day, are very poor. Um, and I'll show you some evidence of that. Um, and the therefore is that we need to do things better and differently. Uh, and, and hopefully, I mean, if I have a purpose here, it's to encourage mathematicians and statisticians to, to take more interest in uh, this field. Uh, I thought I'd show you some more pictures. Um, you know, I showed you the, these images from space. This is what one of these storms approaching might look like in West Africa. Um, so very dramatic cloud fields, and you can see dust being lift by the, lifted by the high winds under the, the, the cloud there, the cloud edge. Uh, here's one that I took. It's not such a good picture, but um, this was from a research aircraft, actually. So a very exciting research flight that we made into one of these storms uh, over Benin. Uh, so again, there's some evidence of the, the dust being being lifted uh, just ahead of the rainfall in this kind of region here. Uh, the, these storms, uh, the, they do produce high winds at the surface. Those winds can lift dust. Uh, and, and that cold, dusty air uh, can travel long distances over the desert, so again, thousands of kilometers. So this is the primary cause of these uh, dust storms, which are called haboobs in the North African region. Uh, so rainfall is can be very variable. Um, so these storms that deliver in this region of West Africa and in the Sahel, the really intense thunderstorms deliver 90% of the rainfall. They come from the most intense systems. So around Niamey, which is uh, you know, uh, the, city, the capital of Niger uh, in the Sahel, um, then 90% of the rain comes from probably about 10 or 12 events in the summer uh, in the monsoon season. So you get these very intense thunderstorm systems. And the characteristic of those is that the rainfall is very uh, inhomogeneous in space. So it's got enormous spatial variability. Uh, so it's kind of interesting looking at the, you know, the, this, this map of the, this is the, the, the map of the annual rainfall, in fact, for, for one year around Niamey. And it's very variable because of the behavior of these storms. Uh, so when you think about averaging things globally, I mean, I was interested in the first talk, then, then actually you've got to deal with the fact that you may be sampling across very high uh, heterogeneity in, in, on the smaller scales. So the point of this plot is to show that over 120, this is a one degree square, in fact, around the AMI, and the dots here are rain gauges. So these are real measurements. Uh, there's very high variability. Over a scale of even 10 kilometers, you get a factor of two difference in the rainfall. Uh, commonly, and that's over the season. Uh, and this is an effect of many storms. Um, one of the implications of this plot, and something we don't fully understand yet, or we don't really understand at all yet, is why this heterogeneity is so strong uh, when this occurs over a number of storms, you know, maybe 10 or 20 storms, and, and that we still don't understand that. Um, it's quite interesting to put this into context, actually, this rainfall. So I have a, a good friend, Andreas Fink, that I've traveled with in Africa, and he's a real uh, uh, lover of the climate statistics. And so if he visits any station, 
it's kind of test of whether they are a good station or not, if they're a good operator, is to ask them their annual rainfall. You know, in conversation, he drops it in. What's your annual rainfall? Uh, and, then, and if they know about it and have something to say about it, then that's a kind of a, somebody who's really interested in their data. Um, and, and sometimes they have no idea, of course. Um, but then he came to visit me in Leeds, and I, I suddenly realized when I was going to pick him up from the train, he was going to ask me about the annual rainfall in Leeds. So I had a massive panic, and I had to quickly look it up before he arrived. So, so I do know what, it, know what it is in Leeds now. So I thought this would be a good test for my audience here. I put Oxford and Cambridge on here just as, you know, um, competitor universities for ours. Um, but, but in fact, there, there isn't a Met Office station in Leeds, but, but Mal and Bingley and Church Fenton are there. So, so maybe this is a kind of a, a question for my audience is to, to see if you, if you know what these are. Uh, and I'll leave that with you for the time being. Uh, so, of course, um, Oxford and Cambridge, you know, UK stations are, I've got a similar amount of rainfall to Niamey, but if you, if I showed you a picture of Niamey, it looks, you know, it's a very alien environment to us. It's very, very dry in the winter. So most of their rain comes in a handful of events, uh, which are really, really intense in, in a, a fixed window in the, in the summer months of the year. So an important thing to be aware of is that, the, the you know, other authors, uh, other presenters today have been talking about climate models uh, and look, talking about temperature in particular. But when you look at rainfall, climate models are all over the place. So with temperature, they they really follow each other, they track each other very nicely. Uh, with um, rainfall, they, they are all over the place. So this plot is actually from old IPCC reports from 2013, but things haven't changed substantially. This, the message is still the same. But there are four plots here showing um, the end of this century uh, projection for the change in annual mean precipitation. Uh, there's different, each map is a different um, emission scenario, RCP. So the bottom right one is the, the you know, the, the worst case in terms of emissions. The forcings are the strongest, anthropogenic forcings. Um, and the key point in this plot is the stippling. So this is sort of stippling on the overlying the colours. Denotes areas where 80% of the models agree on the sign of the changes. Uh, and and the, the sort of shocking part here is that, that over large parts of tropical continents, you know, the Amazon basin, tropical Africa, um, India and, and Southeast Asia, you know, models don't agree on the sign of the changes in rain, annual rainfall. So this is really, uh, you know, a, not a good situation in terms of uh, given that rainfall is possibly the most important thing people want to know about. Um, for their crops and their livelihoods, and yet we can't give guidance about whether it's going to get more or less in the future. Uh, so that's a real problem and it's, and, and it's kind of a wake up call for the research community to try and do this better, but, but it's really difficult to, to simulate. Uh, so that was 2013 report. I mean, there's been little progress. Um, so this paper was came out last year, last year. So there's a lot of words here, but, but in the box, I've kind of summarized what these points are. I mean, climate change is actually happening observably faster than we're reducing the errors in our, our predictions for rainfall. So, you know, we, uh, we're we actually in a situation where we're just monitoring it and, and observing what's happening. We, we don't really know the sign of changes, so we need to do better. Um, so I'm just uh, try and describe, you know, some things we know about or we're, we're kind of working on to, uh, to at least give more useful information to people. So we're faced with these very poor, poor climate prediction systems. Um, so what can we do to give guidance about future rainfall? And I think one uh, way of thinking is that um, we don't have confidence in the, the rainfall in the models, um, but we do have much more confidence in, say, the, the, say the temperatures and the large scale circulation changes in models, um, because models tend to be good at, at those aspects. They tend to be good at solving uh, dynamical equations. Um, so, uh, so if we can get those dyna dynamical regime changes right and, and temperature changes, maybe we can relate the rainfall statistically uh, to those changes, um, which are better handled by the models, and then then use this to give guidance. And and that seems to be giving us some useful um, ways forward that I'll talk about. Um, and I'm going to talk about the climate change context of the sort of decades in the future, but but people are also applying this. Um, on shorter timescales, say uh, monthly timescales, so, so four week forecasts. And this approach of actually predicting the rainfall statistically on the basis of what the model thinks the circulation will be in four weeks time seems to be um, very promising. So I said I was focusing really on the, the West African region, in particular the Sahel, um, 
So the Sahel is this band just to the south of the Sahara. Uh, a lot of people live here, millions of people live here, in fact, because um, because it is agriculturally productive. But but because it's on the margin of the Sahara, it's also very sensitive. So a small, there's a strong climatic gradient. So small changes from year to year have a big impact on people, on the rainfall. Um, so the Sahel suffered a significant long-term drought um, in the 70s and 80s in particular. And, and those of us of a certain age will remember the Live Aid um, concert in was it 82 or 83. Um, and, and that corresponded to significant Sahelian drought that you can see on this um, on this graph, uh, affecting East Africa as well. Um, so in fact, the history of this is quite, you know, is interesting because because in the, the days of independence of African countries from their colonial masters, the um, in the sort of 50s and 60s, then there's a lot of optimism in Africa, a lot of spending and, and rainfall was good in Sahel. Um, but then uh, if I go back, the um, uh, suddenly come the 70s, we had the oil crisis, oil prices went up, uh, a lot of countries were in debt and the rainfall plummeted um, and the rainfall remained low. And when I started studying this in the late 90s, the, the big debate was whether this uh, was a permanent change due to global climate change or whether it was due to interannual variability, uh, sorry, uh, decadal variability, long term natural variability. And I think the, the understanding now is that actually this this mean rainfall change has been to do with internal variability. So we don't see this as being a signal of long term global climate change um, because um, the rainfall is somewhat recovered. So you can see since, say, 2000, um, the rainfall is oscillating around some kind of long term mean. Um, but the situation is more complicated than that. I'll, I'll show more about that. Uh, so if you look in more detail at the rainfall, and this is what uh, this, this was work done by colleagues in Grenoble uh, in, in statistics uh, community there. Um, so Jeremy Pontu, in particular, of this IJ climate paper, uh, did really nice work um, showing that although the rainfall, the mean rail, rainfall has come back to something like uh, a long term mean and something more consistent with the rainfall in the 50s. Um, in fact, there's a greater contribution of extreme rain um, to that that rainfall. So although the mean has come back, the, the distribution of the rain has shifted to one where there's, there are more intense storms and, and associated with that, there are longer gaps between them. So the, the, the statistical distribution of the rainfall uh, has changed. So um, flood events, well, flood events are seen to be more common, but that is associated with this shift in the mean. So, so just to show what that is, the annual rainfall is the left-hand plot in the top here. Sorry, just to explain it by year since 1980, I think, since, to 2017. And, but the contribution of extreme events to that is the right-hand plot going up from 15 to 20 or more. So what I'm going to show now is some, some extension of that work. That work was based on uh, rain gauge data. So extension of that to looking at satellite data from the Meteosat record that goes back to 1982, so nearly 40 years now. Um, so again, looking at these really intense systems, and there's a movie, if you can see it, of one uh, coming across here. So this is work that's primarily done by, by Chris Taylor at CEH, um, Central Ecology and Hydrology in Wallingford. Um, so what he did was to analyse these storms and again look at the trends of these. Um, so over the satellite record, he looked at the ones with the um, cloud top temperatures of minus 40 degrees C. So these are sort of moderate. In the UK, these would be the most intense storms, you know, we can imagine. Uh, but in this region, these are the moderate ones. Um, and in fact, if you look at this, it's not shown exactly here, but the correlation with seasonal rainfall is um, is relatively high. Uh, and and there's, there's no obvious long term trend in these storms. But if you look at the, the extreme storms that go to minus 70 degrees C, so these are really high in the troposphere, uh, very, very intense uh, precipitation, a lot of lightning, uh, then actually the, the frequency of these has tripled. So this was the headline for this paper. The frequency has gone up from, you know, 0.2 or something systems per day uh, up to 0.6 or, or, or so. Um, so really significant increase in these very intense systems as the mean rainfall has come back to normal. So, so in many ways, the mean rainfall coming back has been very good for the local populations, but but it's come with it with this increase in very dangerous storms. Uh, we can look at the map of um, these systems and um, the map sort of, if you look at the top left here, this is the, the, the map of the, the trend 
So where the, the trend is significant, it's colored. So we see this is really confined to the Sahel. This, this map almost defines the Sahel um, zone. Uh, there may be some patches elsewhere in Africa that may have some significance, but really it's this, this um, belt running south of the Sahara. Um, and not shown here, as I mentioned, these changes are, are, are somewhat independent of the annual precipitation. So um, the change at the extremes are not seemingly um, related to the mean in a given year. Uh, there, but but the increasing trend uh, is is the dominant uh, observation. So what Chris was able to do um, in investigating this more deeply was uh, because he had the satellite data and he had this consistent record over thirty five years at the time. Then um, he he was able to relate this to measures of the the, the drivers. Uh, so the larger scale situation associated with these intense storms. So here's another illustration of the challenges of um, of understanding. So this is a, it's a temperature. So it's a, it was, I, was, I was so interested to see the first talk in relation to understanding temperature. So so Chris's approach to trying to understand this complex problem was just to show you um, uh, four different approaches of under, understanding temperature. So these are the warming um, trends, degrees C per decade from four different measures. So the surface stations are shown in the top left. Uh, era interim is the reanalysis. So that's what we mentioned in discussion with Kevin. Uh, then historical uh, model simulations, CMIT-5 simulations. This is the climate models, which were talked about just in the last talk. Uh, and then the satellite measure in the bottom left. So the generally consistent conclusion from these is that Sahara has warmed a lot uh, and probably warmer than everywhere else. I think you also saw this in one of the movies that Kevin showed in the first talk, um, that the, the deserts around the globe, in fact, that it, it's observed, and there's a good physical explanation for this, that, that deserts are warming and will warm faster than other regions because of the sensitivity to, to water vapor um, in the radiative uh, forcing. So the desert is it apparently warmed uh, faster than other regions. Um, and then the climate model projections in the bottom panel show this uh, continuing. Um, so the temperature, the meridional temperature difference uh, is projected to increase. Uh, and the other thing to read from this, though, is this Sahel zone on the um, edge of the Sahara. So the purple box here doesn't have a very obvious increase in temperature over this record. It certainly appears to be, it's almost at a minimum. <laughs> so it appears that, that the, uh, there's not a clear increase in temperature. Uh, and, and also, it's not shown here, but the humidity is not clearly increasing in this region. So we looked at the humidity more closely, and these are observations, in fact, storm by storm. So these are from uh, GPS measurements. So GPS measurements with, a, with an observing station at the surface, you can measure the column water, so precipitable water. Um, so PW is precipitate. Oh, I, I need to explain my acronyms. I'm sorry. Just can somebody shout out if I haven't explained something, you know, some meteorological jargon, but MCS is mesoscale convective system. So that is the big, the big organized storms. Um, so looking at many of these storms at the surface at a GPS station, um, you find that as a storm ar arises, you get a big increase in, in the column water, the precipital water. So it's, it's something like six, so maybe 15%. Um, but then if you compare the most intense in the right hand plot and the least intense storms, the most intense are the blue and the least are the red, uh, you find that the most intense have a, a much bigger increase in their, their column moisture as they occur. Uh, but if you look more than six hours ahead, there's no particular evidence of that. So this suggests that the, the, the storms are not more intense because they have a more intense environment, um, but more intense because they're somehow milking more moisture out of that environment. Um, so the intense storms are extracting more of the same available moisture is, is, is an inference from this. But if you if you look at what is associated with the intensity, well, the first thing that we saw in the, the, the trend was that the temperature difference from the Sahara to the south uh, is a strong uh, relationship, is also increased. Uh, and to go into the meteorology of this region, in fact, uh, the temperature difference from south to north, from um, from the, the essentially the Guinea coast and the ocean, which is cool, into the Sahara, which is hot, that temperature gradient is associated with a jet from the east. It's called the African easterly jet. So the plot on the right 
uh, sorry, I should have explained my axes. That I'm used to a meteorological audience, but but so so the the y-axis on these both these panels is uh, pressure decreasing upwards. So that, that's basically height is the y-axis, and the x-axis here is latitude going from five to twenty-five north. Um, so the right hand of these plots, uh, the contours are the African easterly jet. So it's blowing into the into the page into the board um, at a height of about four kilometers, a value of minus twelve there. So there's a jet flowing into the board here. Um, so that's the sort of African, West African equivalent of our jet stream. Our jet stream is higher up, but it exists for the same region. Ours comes from the West because it's cold in the North. Uh, and in this region, uh, it's hot in the North. So you get a jet from the East. Um, so what we see in terms of the trend is an increase in the, the, the jet and, and a shift of this to the North. Um, so the, the correlations point by point between the MCS temperatures, so, so the, the, the coldness and the intensity of the storms and the atmospheric variables has, has got these signs. Um, so we see a, a, an increasing of the easterlies, where this blue is in the top right, uh, increasing the jet and moving to the north, and then increasing the westerlies at low levels. So that together increases the, the difference in the wind, that's the wind shear. So we're seeing stronger wind shear. Uh, we're also in the, the left-hand panel, we're seeing warmer and, and in fact drier air. The, the dryness is not shown, but, but warmer air uh, at mid-levels here. So both of these are consistent um, in, in the understanding of how these storms organize. This wind shear is known from many, many studies, say in the USA, uh, around the world. Uh, it's something which intensifies and organizes storms. So the conclusion from all this, um, from the observations of this region is that the um, the storms are, are intensifying or have intensified in you know, this threefold increase in the most extreme storms uh, as a result not of the temperature and humidity increasing locally, but as a result of the dynamics changing, the, the wind shear increasing, and possibly the mid-level temperature uh, and dryness uh, getting more dry. Uh, so, so essentially, the message we have is that the storms are getting more intense because they are um, becoming dynamically more effective and then dynamically they're able to take more moisture out of the same supply. Um, so it's an interesting case where the effect of climate change on the large scale creates this large scale gradient, changes the large scale flow and that makes the storms dynamically more active and, and in turn generates more rainfall, not by just simply increasing more moisture, so increasing moisture. Um, so this is quite different to sort of global you know, the, the, the simplest thought picture we have of how rainfall changes globally, uh, which is which is a sensible one, is that if you increase the moisture available globally, then rainfall increases because there's more moisture available. And, and that overall is, is true. Um, but in this part of the world, that, that the rainfall, the moisture hasn't changed. Uh, but what has changed is the storms have got more intense uh, and therefore they, they extract more moisture from the same same environment. Um, so there's a problem in the bottom two bullets uh, here. So, um, so how can we predict, use this kind of information to predict future rainfall? Because the, the, the GCM, the, the model rainfall is unreliable. So the principle is if we can look at the drivers, we've got a driver here, which is this, the, the temperature gradient from the Sahara to the south uh, and the, the wind shear. Um, so so our, our premise is that we could use that as a, um, a proxy um, for the rainfall. And so what we're going to use is use very high resolution um, model simulations where we do have confidence in the rainfall prediction to see how the, the storms will change in a warmer climate. So we do have these simulations for Africa, and, and this was from a project called Future Climate for Africa, and the Met Office ran a sensationally high resolution climate simulation for Africa. Um, at a resolution of four kilometers. So this is now enough to represent the, the biggest storms um, properly in the model. And we find that the model representation is, is transformed. So the models are represented much, much better. We can't, we can't run this globally uh, yet because we can't afford it. So we can't do this for a climate simulation, but we can do it for a regional um, area and we can look at these, these drivers. So in the model, you know, these are what the, the size of the storms. So, so the tracking of these is automated. Um, so, you know, the, the storms are identified as objects in rainfall or in cold cloud uh, and then tracked. And we can look at the properties of those um, statistically. I'm just looking at my watch. Um, so in the model, we we can't, you know, the model is very expensive, so we can't run it for long periods of time. But we do have a 10 year current climate period and a 10 year future climate um, at the end of the century. 
Um, so do they become more intense in the future? And the answer is yes. So we do see the um, a significant increase um, uh, in the the most uh, or in the intensity of the storms. Um, so that's in this uh, distribution. So uh, this is within each storm. Um, we find the the peak of the rainfall as the 99th percentile within that storm, and then plot the distribution, the the, the PDF uh, of of those values um, for current and future climate, and we find an increase um, in the peak storm intensity distributions. And the tail here, of course, in terms of intensity, is what's important. You know, the really intense, really intense ones. And then we can look at the drivers of these. And then, then we come up to a, a kind of a challenge to our understanding, because actually when we look at this future change going um, 100 years into the future, or actually 80 years into the future now, um, we find that there isn't much change in the shear. So while in, there is an increase in the shear, but it's not very much. It's going you know, here from the mean of 18.43 meters per second to a mean of 19.36. So there is an increase in the shear, which will be consistent through the model I just showed you and through our understanding of the past data uh, with intensifying rain. But 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 when we go to the future climate, we find that the moisture distribution is totally transformed. So we have distributions that barely overlap. Uh, so because the temperature has increased so much uh, in the model simulation, uh, then we have a really different. So this is what we didn't see in the observations. We didn't see a significant change in, in humidity uh, in over the past 35 years. But going forward to the end of this century, we see this enormously in the projections. And we have some confidence in that because it's one of these large scale measures that the models are good at, at generating. So in fact, uh, we have a sort of a, a this, this is the point we've reached at the moment, I think, um, to try and encapsulate where we stand. We see two really important drivers of the intensity of rain. Um, we see shear is, um, and, and if, if I, I put this in the sketch, which we've used in our projects to some extent. Um, if you look at the observational period from 1980 to 2020, then the, the shear has increased and the, and the um, precipital water has not changed very much. So over this period, we've seen storm intensity dominated by this. But when we look to the future, then we don't see uh, shear increasing so much, but precipital water takes off uh, and, and follows a steeply increasing curve. And it is a very nonlinear function of uh, temperature. So, um, so which of these dominates the extreme rain? Well, when we look at our simulations for 2100, our future simulation, then the precipitable water dominates uh, the changes. But if we were to look um, at an intermediate date, like 2050, we don't know yet, because we don't have simulations there. And, and so this is the point we're at, I think, in terms of our, our work, is to try to, to understand how these two play out in, in the meantime. The one thing we can say with these is they both go in the same direction. So. So it's not like these two effects are competing and we're unsure what the sign is. We're really quite, we're quite uh, clear that, that storm intensities have increased significantly. Well, when I say significantly here, I don't mean statistically significantly. I mean significantly in terms of the impact on people, you know, in, in a, um, a way which is significant to people. Um, they over the last the, the 40 years, but, but um, and we, the drivers that we understand uh, are, both consistent the both of these drivers are consistent with this increase uh continuing um uh, in a in a you know a uh an important way uh there's a there's a challenge here in that this fantastic model that we have it gets so many things of the storms much better but it doesn't catch the capture the driver the shear driver very well uh this is a kind of a, a technicality i suppose in terms of the, my conclusion it doesn't affect the conclusion but in terms of taking this, uh, it doesn't affect the conclusion because the shear isn't changing much. Um, but it, it is a headache here. And, and so we are looking into um, to understanding that in our work now. So I, I said in my um, abstract, I wanted to talk about extreme timescales of prediction. So I've talked there about decadal and, 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 and uh, to the end of the century projection. Um, but, but again, when we're giving guidance to people in the region, you know, we're, we're we say that the storms have increased in the Sahel um, and we're expecting the intensification of future storms and we're expecting that across Africa because when it's dominated by the humidity then that is just a you know it's, just, it's something that's not really so dependent on geography um, so we need to do something now and and climate change in this sense is not hypothetical it's um you know it, it's it's a reality at the moment you know we were talking about 25 years ago hypothetically but now 25 years on here we are 
you know, we're in the middle of it. Um, so we have to do something about it. And, and a lot of that is about increasing people's resilience. And so this project, African Swift, which is one of the GCRF projects, is looking at uh, improving forecasting and information for people on, on a range of timescales. But I'm going to talk about the extremely short timescale, which is now casting. So I'm going to go to absolutely the opposite end of the spectrum of, of time. So now casting, I mean, now casting is something that that's uh, been invented in the US and, and UK, probably in the 70s. Uh, and in the USA, it's a big thing in terms of tornado alerts. So the principle is that that if your weather forecasts are um, are not very good, um, oh, I missed a slide here, actually. I had a slide which which um, justifies this. Um, just as the, um, the climate models of rainfall are very poor, the weather forecasts are extremely poor too. Um, so a 24-hour weather forecast um, for Africa is is no better than climatology. Oh, it's unfortunate. I somehow lost, I, I deleted a slide by accident. But um, there's a paper that uh, I can give you the reference that, that from 2020 showing this, uh, what, what people have known for a long time, I suppose, that that in fact the um, the 24-hour forecasts, even bias-corrected ensemble forecasts uh, for most of our tropical Africa, are not really better than climatology, which is to say that you'd be just as, you know, just as well saying the rain is is tomorrow, you know, just using the average statistics for um, climatologically for for May, late May, as, as actually using a weather forecast. So in that environment, you know, we wake up in the morning, we don't have a reliable forecast today. We need to know what's happening now, and we, we use the information about now. So as I said, in the, in the States, this is the bedrock of tornado prediction. You know, you see storms happening now, and you, look at the characteristics of those or whether they are likely to be tornadic uh, and then you send alerts on the basis of that and you monitor them and you, you project them forward in time as much as you can. So now casting includes these these attributes. It hasn't been used in Africa much at all, particularly tropical Africa, um, partly because radars and there's some pictures of those on the right are hard to, well they're not all radars in that picture but there is a radar, they're hard to um, uh, so, so technically, the technology is hard to operate. Uh, so in fact, throughout the developing world, it's kind of marginal whether countries have the technological know-how to, to maintain radars. But we have a really good satellite data. So, so in the SWIFT project, we are using satellite data um, to now cast storms. And, and in fact, we're using algorithms that have been around for 10 years at least. So we're just employing existing know-how. But an example of this is this big storm, which caused a lot of damage in Dakar. It, it absolutely caused devastation in Dakar. So Dakar is the city in the absolute western tip of Africa here. Um, earlier, uh, well, well, less than a year ago. Um, and this, the, the point is these very big storms in that I showed you in that first movie, a lot of those last for many hours. Um, and in fact, they move at a steady speed. You know, they're quite um, well organized and, and coherent. So you can see this case in, in uh, going from left to right, it goes forward in time. Uh, and, and actually what a now casting system can do is just forward project these. Uh, and of course, many of us do this by eye. If we look at radar data, you know, I look at the rainfall radar data if I'm cycling home from work, uh, just to decide if I can if I can dodge a shower, you know. And uh, um, and so this is what, what this system is doing um, uh, computationally. So the bottom row is just a forward, I say just, it's a an algorithm which is projecting uh, the, the top row forward and, and they're shown at the same validation time. So the storm moves steadily across the ocean and, and, a, and an algorithm is able to capture that quite accurately with, with useful accuracy. Uh, so we are um, implementing this and we've got um, this uh, solution going. We, we're running it out of leads at the moment and got it available on a web page. So our, African partner institutions are starting to use it, but but our you know in parallel with that we're getting the system set up in within Africa. We're um, particularly encouraging university operational partnerships here um, because the universities actually hold a lot of know-how, um, particularly when it comes to technology. You know they've got lots of, lots of young people who are good with computers and you know like fiddling with the, the internet and, and sorting out you know solutions. So in fact partnership between the university and the operational center can can keep the operational center you know sharp and up to date with with the solutions um, and we're also doing research on this and actually there's just loads that can be done on this and and you know we need more um mathematicians and data scientists and and, and statisticians to get interested in these kind of problems uh 
I have to say that you, you will be competing, competing with Google. I didn't put a slide in about this, but Google published something recently and they're working on this problem too. So uh, we can't compete with Google's uh, computational firepower, I don't think, but but hopefully we can compete with them intellectually. Um, so this is a, actually a master's student I had last year and in a 10 week project, he did this really nice example where he looked at a number of uh, uh, machine learning algorithms uh, and the this, this array of solutions here that the first one is, is well one time step is the left hand column and then 10 time steps is on the right so that's a five hour forward projection and his best algorithm is the top one uh, which uh, produces something uh, which well I'll say it's pretty good uh, and I'll try to quantify that by saying that we can see certain you know you can see certain items and features in this which are captured faithfully whereas other algorithms maybe blur them out or lose some um, so, um, so there's a lot that can be done, and this this stuff is useful, and it can save people's lives. You know, with four, five hours warning, people can can corral their cattle, or they can protect their children, or, or whatever, or, or they can, all sorts of things they can do. Um, so, so just to say that it's all within our reach, and there's a lot we can do. Um, at the moment, we're also trying to get this onto mobile phones. So we've written an API, uh, and we're trying to get a an app together, which hopefully will be done. In a couple of months, we're working at the moment with the Kenya Meteorological Department uh, and trying to to make this commercially viable. Um, uh, in the sense that we ought to be able to get funding from um, uh, commercial or, or public uh, private sector organisations, for example, tea producers um, who are interested in protecting their supply chain, um, so we can get information to uh, to economic concerns that can benefit from this. So hopefully, well, this is early days, so. But hopefully we can we can start to get commercial income from this. Um, so uh, just looking at the clock, I had some. Yeah, maybe I'll just move on. Um, maybe I'll just to show the last version. I'm talking about rainfall. Um, this going back to the, the the climate models. This is a way of looking at the rainfall. Um, you know, people um, are concerned about the increasing temperatures, but but they often can't translate it into their own environment. And actually, what matters in these marginal climates is, are the extremes. So, so this is a way of looking at those. Um, and there's two models here, and the left-hand one is the, the CP4 model, the, the state-of-the-art model, so we can focus on that. And what this shows is the percentile of the, let's think, it's the percentile of the future climate distribution at which, no, sorry, it's the percentile of the current climate distribution at which the median of the future climate sits. So where this is gray, this says that the, the future climate median sits above the 95th percentile of the current climate. So it's a way, I mean, that, that takes a bit of explaining and it's quite technical, um, but actually you can translate this to, to a lot of many people as saying that, you know, the future climate norm, the, the, the median day, the, the normal day is, is really your extreme in your current climate. So extremes are going to become the norm, uh, is a way of, of, of translating that, that plot. Uh, I'll jump over that. So, okay, so I'll come to, to conclusions. I'm just repeating the things I've said. I mean, um, uh, extreme storms have increased in frequency and intensity. Um, we've got these kilometer scale models, which which can, you know, really help in understanding this, but but they also have drawbacks still. And so there's a lot of work to do on that. Um, in the current environment, then, we need weather forecasting. You know, we, we're facing the, the reality of these increasing storms. Um, and there's a lot to be done, but also massive opportunity for doing um, you know, doing the obvious things and doing the simple things now. Uh, and the last point was about the the the, the dire prospects. So at some point there will be, um, you know, a lot of intense storms, and the the the, the norm uh, of the future will be the extreme of now. And and I think the world has to face up to that. Uh, I I've got plots I didn't show for temperature and humidity, which are equally frightening. And this kind of thing keeps me awake at night, to be honest. So you know, it's something the world needs to needs to take very seriously. Uh, so I will close that. No, I won't actually. I've, I've got one more slide, which is the rainfall. So I don't know if, if, if you all knew this, but um, but actually there's a very strong rainfall gradient across our, our region. Um, so actually Malham, if you compare Malham and Church Fenton, so Church Fenton in the Vale of York has less than half of Malham and, and sort of nearly half of Bingley. So actually when Andreas Fink comes to visit, you know, the, when, when he asks you about the rainfall in this region, then it, it's uh, really got an interesting gradient and, and actually it's probably got a lot of very local variability in that so you can give him an interesting answer and then I'll close here 
Yes, that is, that is absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas, and um, to, to the applause thing as well. There we go. Um, I, 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 was, I, I was all, all prepared to, to hazard a guess at the, at the Leeds thing, which is because, because we're um, well, what I, what I think was the right side of the Pennines. Uh, that generally we get, you know, obviously we get, we get less rain than Manchester because the weather, weather's been that way. So my, my, my guess was going to be that we have less rain than Oxford or Cambridge, but um, maybe it's more, more, more sophisticated than that. I think it's somewhere between the, you know, I didn't have a, a Leeds measure. Somewhere in on the internet, I found 805 this afternoon. Um, but 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 basically, it's in between Church Fenton and Bingley. So um, we're on a steep gradient. You know, as you go from, well, I mean, Church Fenton to Bingley, Bingley is probably only 30 miles or so, isn't it? And and there's a big, big difference. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's just really, really interesting. Uh, I, I think that the I was just going to ask one one question if I, if I, if I can, which is so my, my, my sense is that so it's a bit of a naive question, but it's, the the situation in Africa is obviously heavily driven by the geography. So you've got the you know a mass expanse of desert in the in the, the northeast corner, uh, and, uh, and it's you know it's a vast vast sort of land land mass without 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 huge huge water sources. Now, I, just, I just wondered how. Far you thought that 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 this this work is sort of translatable into? Well, I'm trying to think of another similar similar area, but um, you know, maybe maybe the, the the southeastern corner of China, for example, in the Gobi Desert, or or you know, do, do in in effect we end up needing models for each um, for each different land landmass. Yeah, it's a really good point. In fact, we have a proposal in to NERC at the moment to ask exactly that question uh, and to try and translate this. So, so in principle, we can use the satellite data globally. They're different satellites, but we could do the same analysis globally. So we've got a proposal in to do that. I think that the African rainfall, for some reason, which is a bit of a mystery, I mean, if I went back to one of those maps, is is predicted worse for tropical Africa than the other continents. So the other continents, the, the daily rainfall is better predicted. Um, we don't know why that is. I mean, what's special about Africa and the tropics, but uh, that we've got some guesses. But but when it comes to to the, the sort of seasonal rainfall, then it's very poor in, in many of these regions, in the monsoon regions, so Southeast Asia and, and India. I mean, India is a real headache for the Met Office, Indian rainfall prediction. So um, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think the principles, you know, or the principle thinking should apply everywhere. But, but I mean, there are certain differences too. And, and this part of the world has very low topography. Um, so all these climatic gradients, you know, to do with the Sahara and, and the Sahel are to do with the climate system and not to do with topography. Whereas if you say, look at India, then the role of the Himalayas is very important and uh, India and China um, and the coastlines are more complex. So I, I think there'll be similarities and differences as you look at other parts of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, make, makes sense. So we've got a question from from Laura. Um, so how, how you consider how extreme value theory could help demonstrate changes in extreme storms over the decades? Yeah, that is a good one as well. Um, I I have to say I I I'm not uh, entirely knowledgeable about extreme value theory, although a little bit. And um, in fact, I had a student project for undergraduate students this year. Um, that I very much enjoyed with some very bright students. So one student actually did uh, fit a uh, extreme value. Uh, so it's the GEV distribution to to some of the data. Uh, so she modelled the data with a um, uh, an autoregressive model and then fit um, uh, fit a distribution to that. Uh, so that that produced some you know some interesting conclusions for one location. So yeah, certainly I think that's. That, that's a, a good approach. Um, there are lots of really, you know, there's loads of really interesting things to do. And, and I'm happy to collaborate with people. We've got this a sensational data set in the CP4 model. At the moment, we've been working with these people in um, uh, in Grenoble um, who are, you know, very good statisticians. And what they're doing is, is constructing, um, constructing uh, sort of storm objects statistically in the data. So we know that the storm is composed of kind of coherent structures. So it comes with a very intense burst of rain that lasts about half an hour and then 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 a period of rain that's that's longer lasting for about five or six hours. And so that the structure and shape of that affects the impact, so in hydrology. 
Uh, and then the sequences of storms matter for hydrology or for engineering. You know, if you get three storms in three days, then the surface gets saturated and you, you get flooding, whereas one storm on its own wouldn't necessarily cause flooding. So those details of the distributions are really critical. Um, so, I mean, it's just to say that, that there's far more that matters than just the seasonal uh, mean, even though that is important. Um, so there's a whole load of really interesting things to do um, with the data. And, and, and all those questions are conditioned really by what the user needs to know. You know, engineers want to know uh, frequency, uh, duration, and what is it? Uh, frequency, uh, there's, there's, there's three things they want to know. Uh, intensity, frequency, and duration. So, um, you know, there's a lot that, that could be done. Absolutely. So we, we run, run a bit short of time. I'm sorry. Unless, unless anyone, anyone else has any, any more questions. But um, that, 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 it's absolutely fascinating. And um, th th thank you very much, um, Doug, for, 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 um, for, for going through that. It's um, a sort of film going into some reading, actually. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really, really, really interesting topic. Uh, and th thank you also to um, to, to Kevin and um, and Kev Kevin and um, and Donald. So, um, so I, I think there's, all, there's, so, there's so much in this, this whole sort of topic area, isn't there? So, so, so many um, different aspects of it. I think it's really really fascinating. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm losing my voice. So. Um, so I, I'll just say thank you again to, to, to all three speakers. Um, thank, thank you to, to the audience.